So I think the presentations are in the increasing order of budget size, roughly. So anyway, the SDSS Sky Server, the Sky Server is actually the web portal to what we call the catalog archive server, uh, which is a system that uh, serves the catalog data to the wide uh, user community for the SDSS. But we kind of use the term interchangeably to even mean the whole system. And uh, uh, the, as the uh, title suggests, I'll be going over some of the bad, ugly, good parts, not necessarily in that order. And uh, uh, the Sky Server has been in operation since uh, 2000, so it's been like 13 years now. And we've gone from the data size that it serves uh, from a few hundred gigabytes to uh, more than 12 terabytes now. So it's proved quite durable. So a little bit about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, it was dubbed the Cosmic Genome Project. It's the largest uh, celestial census of its kind uh, by, by, by far. It started in 92, the planning uh, and everything. And the uh, phase one, which uh, comprised SDSs one and two, uh, ran from 2000 to 2008. And already by year 2005, which was the completion of SDSs one, um, it had increased the uh, number of objects that astronomers have uh, detailed data on by a factor of 1,000 say from like 100,000 galaxies to 100 million. Uh, the data is all public. Oh, we had uh, roughly annual data releases starting with the early data release or EDR, which was a sneak preview, and DRs one through seven uh, for the, those two parts of the survey. Uh, the data is all public, um, and those are the kind of range of sizes that we've uh, gone uh, f over the last uh, eight uh, years of that phase of the survey. and then. Uh, it's a multi-institution -inst international project. Um, so, um, you know, including uh, uh, institutions like Princeton, uh, University of Washington, um, uh, Fermilab, Johns Hopkins. And in particular, Johns Hopkins provided two of the main components. One was the spectrograph, an instrument, and the catalog uh, archive server, which served the catalog data. And work on that began as early as 97. And all the data was served from Fermilab. Uh, so now uh, we, have, we are into SDSS-3, which uh, starts the phase two of SDSS. Uh, and the SDSS-3 catalog archive uh, uh, server is uh, located at Hopkins, so Fermilab is no longer part of the consortium. Uh, and the latest release we had was DR10, uh, which uh, has those uh, the main numbers. Uh, 1.2 billion rows uh, in the object catalog. Actually, it's uh, of those 470 million, about roughly half billion are unique uh, images and three million unique spectra. And of course, the next part of it, SDSS-4, is scheduled to begin in 2015. So SDSS never dies, I guess. And it's a re real tribute to the um, durability of the instruments and the software that we keep having uh, uh, you know, next stages of the project. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the SDSS uh, is probably the only multi-institution international project of its kind, at least in astronomy. And you can read all the sordid details. I mean, everything wasn't obviously hunky-dory. There were a lot of uh, uh, things, see-me things going under the roof. Uh, and so uh, you can read about funding crisis, culture clashes, pipeline panics, and even the monitor, tele monitor telescope fail failure at the last minute. So they had to take the uh, telescope from the roof of Johns Hopkins Astronomy Department and take it to, the, to Apache Point Observatory. Uh, a very able project manager saved it from falling apart at a crucial stage. And of course, the sky server has had its own growing pains, which I will be talking about. So let's start with the ugly. As I said, a journey of 1,000 terabytes starts with a single disastrous step. Um, so uh, Yasek asked me to talk about the strategic thinking, and I'm not sure we did that much. Uh, but anyway, the original choice, uh, which we actually strategically selected to be an object-oriented database um, because we thought it was a really good conceptual fit to the data. And uh, also the performance uh, that the product had at the time was superior to the other products in the market. And uh, uh, it was also platform independent, which was a big plus. Um, we had to, of course, overcome some major defi deficiencies. This was in the mid-1990s or so, mid to late 1990s. Uh, we had to adopt a uh, non-standard object query language rather than SQL. We had to build in uh, quite a bit of query optimization because what came with it was not enough for our spatial queries. And also, uh, we had to build an actual server application that served data. This is what we call the science portal, which was meant for the power users. 
But anyway, we thought we were doing the right things and we thought we were winning. But uh, we were about to be proven wrong. So with DR1, it was fairly early in the project, uh, when we went from EDR to DR1, the amount of data multiplied by more than a factor of four, and problems began to emerge. And this was actually because coincidentally, a new release of the product came out, which was uh, supposed to be a multi-threaded version, and the performance really uh, went downhill. We also found a major bug in accessing floating point arrays. And uh, I think the last straw for us was that uh, if uh, one of the threads uh, in the server application uh, encountered a fatal error, then the whole application died and throwing off all users. So we were eventually forced to migrate to a, to a relational database platform, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. And this was in fact, uh, uh, there was a happy accident that we had started working with Jim Gray from Microsoft Research at uh, the same time that we were uh, releasing the science portal. And what uh, Jim Gray and Alex Zillay ported, um, the early data release to SQL Server, that was meant to be the actual public server, which was uh, supposed to handle the lightweight queries from a larger number of users, though. But the public portal really stole the show and outperformed the science portal over the first six months to a year. And so we eventually, I mean, it was, we had something to fall back on, which was really great. And so we had to abandon the, the object-oriented uh, um, database for the relational one. So in the process, we kind of wasted about six person years of development. A lot of those were my development uh, effort. But hopefully it was not all wasted, as we will see. Uh, so coming to the good part, since I mentioned Jim Gray, and that was really the best part of the survey uh, for us. Um, and as Jim Gray famously said, you have only two things to fear, failure and success. Luckily, we were on the side of success. Uh, so we did need to certainly build something, but what was important was that we had a really strong foundation, and that was Microsoft SQL Server. Um, we built these three pillars on top of that foundation, the Sky Server web interface, an image cutout visual browsing service, and CAS Jobs, a batch query service, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, we did not have to build any of the basic query engine components, and certainly one of, this was one of the hard lessons we learned from objectivity. Query optimization is best left to the pros. It's not something that uh, small uh, software budgets can get into. So uh, we did build, uh, the components that we did build were turned out to be really reusable building blocks. And that was really one of the best uh, outcomes of our uh, work so far. The Sky Server, which uh, incorporates an extensive built-in uh, science uh, query and metadata support system. And we built it using this uh, um, approach that Jim Gray taught us, the 20 queries approach, where you ask uh, the scientists, what are the 20 most important or representative queries that you want to ask the system? And that's how we designed the schema and the, and the um, indices and things like that. And then we also, um, because Jim, Jim Gray also asked us to keep very um, detailed uh, traffic and usage records, we realized that we needed to separate the, uh, the power users from the casual users. And so we designed this CAS jobs batch query workbench, which was an asynchronous way to handle queries in batch mode. Um, and that separated the fast and slow queries uh, and isolated them to different servers, which was very important. Uh, that also turned out to be a benchmark for uh, how to do science, especially in astronomy. Uh, then we uh, created the image cutout service, which was a visual JPEG browsing and cutout service. And then we also, in the process, built this data loading pipeline called SQL Loader, which allowed us to automate the data loading process and build in some really good data validation and history uh, capability. And then we also created the hierarchical triangular mesh, which was a generally applicable spatial index for spatial queries. Uh, and the best part about it was that it combined with the common language runtime that Microsoft uh, C-sharp.net uh, had. And so it was uh, gave really fast performance. Um, uh, and it was a spatial index built right into the database. And of, uh, all this is available for download, free download from skyserver.org site. But it is indeed all Microsoft SQL based, at least at this time. So this is the usage uh, from the usage data. This is what we have over the last uh, 10, 12 years. And there are some high points here. You know, when uh, Galaxy Zoo was announced on BBC TV, uh, our servers literally melted down. 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but if you go to the galaxyzoo.org site, you will see it's a very uh, um, amazing citizen science site. Uh, this is uh, when uh, DR7 was released, 39 million queries in literally two days. Not all of them were actually served, but the server didn't die. That was one good thing. Uh, somebody was trying to download pretty much the whole thing, I think. Um, so this is the Sky Server traffic uh, page, which lists the up to the minute, uh, well, up to the last hour usage. There is the monthly, uh, and then this is the daily usage here. So um, this is where we keep track of it. And this is the reusable aspect of what we've uh, developed over the years. So this is the SDS genealogy. This is a courtesy of Alex Zillet. So all the components, as you can see, they, uh, they gave rise to different uh, um, uh, applications, and they were used in various different uh, ways and uh, application. The non, uh, so these um, beige colored ones are the non-astronomy applications. Uh, life under your feet is in earth science. This is space. this is in medicine, this is turbulence in physics, and then geno genomics. So, now the bad part. So, of course, we had a very wide-ranging user community, and we did try to keep everyone happy, and that was probably a mistake, but uh, I think th with Jim's help, we managed to survive even that. So, one of the main uh, big problems we had almost from the outset was that we did not really have a data distribution plan, and uh, people uh, constantly wanted to download a large part or all the data for any given data release. And, uh, uh, you know, we had a hard time keeping up with that. But again, luckily, uh, there was the National Center for Data Mining at uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, and Bob Grossman and his uh, group. They had really fast pipes to everywhere in the world, and uh, they managed to uh, distribute our data to the world at large. Uh, I think it's recommended that you prepare a plan for this and have an offline copy that serves this. Uh, now we channel Donald Rumsfeld. So uh, the known unknowns that uh, we kind of expected to encounter but still um, uh, gave us some pause, uh, that we had to have multiple copies. And in our experience, we had to have up to six copies. And uh, something that uh, you know, we felt really uh, in our day-to-day -day operations was how long it took even to do one single copy for a backup. Uh, our worst case was, whoops, our worst case was like uh, 30 hours. Um, so um, let's see what's happened. OK, let me just go to the next slide. So continuing the known unknowns, you have to host multiple copies if you're, if you're going to um, provide data releases. Uh, and you, know, you get into this kind of, uh, this was our layout at Fermilab for DR6. And so as you can see, we have several servers dedicated to each release, and we have a pool of web servers. And essentially, the hardware plan must take this into account if you're going to have uh, regular data releases. That's just the point I wanted to make here. And then the unknown things that you don't even know can hit you because you're going to untested regimes of whatever product you're using. Uh, an example for us was that uh, with our CAS jobs MyDB system, where we gave every user uh, their own personal database, we ended up uh, having more than 2,000 uh, personal databases. And all of them open at one time caused the system to run out of memory. And of course, the size affects everything, uh, from query performance to uh, schema changes, which were uh, rendered uh, undoable in our case, because uh, um, it took like several days to do the schema change on the largest table, which was more than a couple of terabytes. And then we come to uh, lessons learned. So I think there are some useful things we can uh, conclude at least in the buy versus build uh, context. Um, you need to buy a strong foundation for your uh, whatever query services that you're going to provide. Um, and uh, it has to be, at least in our case, coming from a science, for a, in a science budget, it has to be cheap, yet reliable, scalable, and customizable, which is asking a lot, but it's not impossible. Of course, in our case, we had a really sweet deal that we had Jim Gray helping us through nearly most of it. And, you know, that, that is probably responsible for most of our success right there. Um, the performance and reliability are far more, far more important than getting a perfect fit to your uh, um, data space. 
Um, you will have to build some components um, no matter what, but hopefully they're only the domain-specific components and not some basic parts of the engine. Um, I don't know about whether you can make them open source, but at least like in our case, you can make them freely downloadable so other people can reuse your um, whatever you've developed. And one of the other things that Jim Gray taught us was go from working to working. So don't try to redesign everything, uh, redesign a component from scratch. Always grow from what works and then adapt and build on top of that. So if you had to do it all over again, I think we would still go with the commercial database management system. I'm not sure we would, uh, I don't know whether we would go with an open source uh, system. Um, it would, uh, the asterisks mark the things that we did not do or did not do properly uh, the first time around. So we would like to uh, have um, something with the distributed cluster support. We would like to have uh, array support. Uh, that would have been nice. Uh, I wish we had time to evaluate multiple technologies. Um, and uh, uh, I think some of the things that we did correctly was apply the 20 query approach, but we did not have a data distribution plan. And we also did not have a data migration plan. Uh, and I'm just going to list this uh, and I think stop right there. Am I? Yeah, zero, zero, zero. Okay. <laughs>